I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Uh, we have launched from this passage of Scripture for almost two months now, and of course we've covered this passage in depth, and now we're, we're spinning off of it to uh, a few more passages. But I want us to read this yet again and understand this and add another layer to our conversation on this topic of being rich, doing more, and giving more. So 1 Timothy chapter number 6, let's read uh, three verses, 17, 18, and 19, very end of that chapter, and this is Paul giving instruction to Timothy that he would give to those that were, are in his church. So here is the instruction from Paul to Timothy, verse number 17. Timothy, charge or command those that are rich in this world. We talked for a week about this specifically. This applies to you. So we are the rich people. As And you may not feel rich, that's fine, but if you are a middle-class American, you are currently compared to the rest of the world and historically compared to the world you're rich. You just have time and resources that many people do not have. So charge them to the rich in this world. And it's going to focus on the internal first so that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. So don't be arrogant and don't migrate your hope to your wealth and away from the Lord. But rather, here's what should happen on the inside. Trust in the living God. So put your trust in him. Just stay right there centered on the Lord. Trust in him who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So understand that it's God that gives to us, and he gives them to us so that we would be grateful, enjoy them, not to feel guilty, but God gives to us. What you have is from the hand of the Lord. Verse number 18, away from the internal, now to the external. So what should we do with this? Well, that they would do good, that they would be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, or willing to share. Paul says, look, tell them that they should do more and they should give more. Tell them that they should have a heart for service. Tell them they should be generous. That this should just be natural because of what the means that they have. Verse number 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So literally there's a future aspect to this that we get to lay up riches in heaven, that we get to enjoy something in the future with what we do here on earth, but we also get to lay hold on eternal life. We get to experience heaven on, on earth while we are here in this moment. So we have begun a conversation. We're almost at the end of it for two months now. October, we talked about giving more, and we specifically talked about finances and money, what the Bible has to say about that. November, we've centered on serving, on being rich in good works, on, on ministering. And I told you a few weeks ago that this was really, November was going to be one long sermon just stretched over four or five weeks as we examine this topic of, of serving, of ministering. And really, November is my biblical response to if you were to ask me the question, Pastor Mark, why should I serve? Why should I minister? Why should I be involved? Why should I do these things? And I want to review just quickly for two minutes a couple of the layers that we've already given to, to answer that question. So, so why should you serve? Well, there's just a simple biblical command to do so. That's kind of baseline. And especially when you have the resources available, those that are rich in this world, we have a command to actually do more because we have more resources, more resources we have more time at our disposal. And you say, well, I don't feel like I have more time. I mean, if you knew my schedule, I'm busy. There's a lot to do. Christmas is coming, and I'm staring down the barrel of Christmas thinking, I'm never going to sleep. Right? Ever been there? But I would, I would argue that our busyness is our own fault. It's not because we don't actually have time. And we've discussed this, but we as Americans, we have the ability to go to work for five days and provide enough food and enough clothing and enough shelter for seven days. Many of us, your family, you, you have the ability that as a family, there's four of you, five of you, six of you, seven of you, however many of you there are. And one family member goes out into the workforce for five days to, pro to provide enough food and clothing and shelter for five, six, seven people for seven days. Now that is unfathomable to much of the world. And what that means is you now have not just more resources, but you have more time, disposable time. But what we do with our time is we load our schedules with things that are not bad necessarily, but they're unnecessary. So we have more time, so what do we do? We begin to say, well, of course, I've got to watch all of the black and gold games. I mean, I've got to watch all the Pens games. i watch all the Steelers games. And Thursday night's game was great, was it not? I watched the game. It was fantastic. 
I, I got I to watch the, you know, the Pirates. It's 120 games when, when they're in season. And, of course, I, I got to, there's things that I want to do, you know. I want to be busy in this, and I've always wanted to take a photography class. And, of course, the kids and the grandkids, they have their stuff. They have football and they have soccer. And, of course, they need gymnastics and basketball. Can't miss out on basketball, right? And, and we also, the, oh, there's dance lessons or there's, we got to take them to, to this and we got to shuttle them here. And then we got to fill up our schedule. And what, what are we begin to do? We become very busy, yes, but with things that are not even inherently wrong. But when, what we do is we begin to shift our schedule away from a priority of the Lord. And ministering and serving gets on the back burner. And that is wrong. And now our schedule is loaded with stuff that's, that's good. Family nights and date nights and those sorts of things. But we fill it up. And what Paul is saying is, look, tell them, you have more time at your disposal. You should actually serve more. You should do more. So why should we serve? Yes, because we have the means. We have the availability to do it. And the Bible tells us to. But beyond that, you're made to minister. If you're a Christian, the Bible tells us that you are actually created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You're made for that. He created you. He saved you for that. Your Bible intake, you sitting here this morning, taking in the Word of God, that Bible intake is for what? For ministering. That all Scripture is given by inspiration, it's profitable. Why? So that the man of God may be throughly furnished unto all good works. So you're made to minister. Your Bible intake is for ministry. And beyond that, last week we talked about a, a, a spiritual gift. According to 1 Corinthians 12, there is a gift wrapped up inside of you. You may have to unpackage it. You may have to discover it. But there's a gift wrapped up inside of you that you're meant to discover and you're meant to use to build up the body of Christ. Not as a toy to play with, but as a tool to build with. So I'm going to add one more layer to, that, to this today, and then next week we'll, we'll wrap it up. And really, what should our motivations be? Beyond all of that, I think there's at least two more very valid biblical layers to our serving. Number one today is looking at the life of Christ. We have to consider Jesus our model. And number two, next week we'll look at the heartbeat of love because love is the ultimate catalyst and the best motivation far beyond guilt or anything else. And t- this morning, I want us to, to add just another layer. We're going to go to John 13, so you can get ready at John 13. And we're going to walk through a few verses and look at Christ, who's our example for serving, who's our example for ministering, who's our example of being rich in good works and ministering to other people. John chapter 13. Let me, let me give you just a, a brief note of background of John chapter 13. We are coming to what has been known as the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper for Jesus. This is the night of Jesus' betrayal. This is less than 24 hours before Jesus will be crucified. And this is coming down to to crunch time in, in the Passion. And Jesus has gathered his 12 disciples together in an upper room there in the, the upper part of Jerusalem to have a Passover meal. And we're going to see what happens during part of this Passover meal. And it's such a beautiful example of what we should do and what we should be and what our mindset should be as Christians because this was the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want us to just walk through a few verses here in John chapter 13 and discover when it comes to our serving, our our being rich in good works, our ministering, that Christ is our example and what did he do because that will help us know the mindset and the heartbeat and the attitudes that we need to have towards service. John chapter 13, look in verse number one. We're gonna start with, with the table And something that's unique about John is that he's going to take three verses describing this this Passover meal that happened, what happened when they were around the table, but John is going to go completely inward. Matthew, Mark, and Luke will describe some of the actions that happen while they're sitting around the table, but John is going to give us some insight into what's happening in the heart and the mind of Jesus, which is a beautiful thing to discover. And so I want us to begin just in verse number one, and we're going to see Jesus' feelings that he's experiencing in these moments. The Bible says in verse number one, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. 
We get to see a a glimpse of the heart of Christ here that Jesus, knowing that his hour has come, knowing that this is, he's about to be crucified, knowing that he is going to be betrayed, knowing the cup that he is going to drink from, that he is going to depart out of this world to the Father, but these are going to remain in the world. In these moments, Jesus is not self-absorbed. Jesus is not self-focused. There's a heart of love for other people, even though there is a heavy burden on him at this moment, even though his soul is troubled in these moments, there is still a heartbeat of others right now. And the Bible says that Jesus loves them, and he even loves them unto the end. Now, that's a remarkable statement. What the Bible is saying is that Jesus loved these men to the furthest extent. Jesus loved them to the fullest. It'd be like you looking at your your wife or your husband and saying, I love you to the moon and back. This is Jesus, his heartbeat. John is telling us is that he loved them to the moon and back. He has, even in these moments with with a heavy burden on his heart, there's a heartbeat of love and these feelings of love that are oozing out of him for these men. And that's important to remember as we walk through this passage because everything he's about to do is going to be out of a heartbeat of love for these guys. So Jesus' feelings are here, but also Jesus' foe is here. Verse number two, supper being ended. The devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. All of the Gospels make it clear that this is the night that Jesus makes it. Jesus knew it beforehand, but he makes it abundantly clear to everyone in the room that Judas is going to betray him this night. And Judas had already begun talks with the priest. He had already begun to connive. And Judas is looking for the opportunity, the Bible says, when the multitudes were away. Judas knew, I cannot bring the priests, I cannot bring the scribes, I cannot bring the guards. Well, there are multitudes around Jesus. They won't let the, him take Jesus. They're all going to be Peters that take their sword and start, start fighting. So Judas is looking, searching for an opportunity where he can get alone, where he can have Jesus isolated, where he can betray him. And this now is the night. Judas knows it's, it's dark. They're going to be in just a, a few hours outside of the eastern gate in Gethsemane, alone, isolated, no one else around it except those 12, and Judas is now looking for this opportunity. And the Bible says that the devil puts in the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. Now, this is not meant to excuse Judas. Judas doesn't get a hall pass, okay? Judas, Judas had a choice, and Judas made a choice to betray Jesus Christ. Judas failed to cast down imaginations. Judas failed And in his job, and he betrays the Lord Jesus Christ. And and the the inward struggle that happens in Judas is something that happens inside of us. The Bible is over and over redundant and replete with these passages that tell us that our, our real battle in the Christian life is not a physiological battle. It's a spiritual battle. And the Bible says that this is something spiritual that's happening inside of Judas, that the devil is placing in his heart a thought. Now, this is not unique to Judas. This this can happen to you. Ever been in a conversation or isolated by yourself, whatever the case may be, and a thought comes flying across your airwaves, your brain, that you think to yourself, where did that come from? Ever had a thought that was, that was literally like so depraved or so wicked that you're surprised that it was even in your own mind? I know I've been there. Where does that come from? Well, many times that comes from not actually on, on the inside like you, but that actually comes from spiritual warfare. This is what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians. Though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And then this, casting down imaginations. Every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What Judas failed to do is oftentimes what, let's not be so utterly tough because that's sometimes our failure as well. That we fail to capture those thoughts for Christ. That we fail to cast down those imaginations. And the Bible says internally, what's happening in Jesus? Well, he has these feelings of love. He loves him to the moon and back. What's happening inside of Judas? Well, really the opposite. It's being placed in his heart to betray him. But also there's Jesus' future that's happening internally. Verse number three, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and he went to God. The Bible even tells us in verse number one that Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he would depart out of this world unto the Father. 
What does it mean that his hour has come? Jesus knew this, this was the time. The crucifixion is going to happen. The Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world is actually going to be slain, going to be crucified. He's going to now give his life, lay it down, a ransom for many. Jesus knows that this is going to happen. If you actually look in, in John 12, and you can just kind of peek over at that chapter just a page before, the Bible tells us in verse number 23 that this is, this is when, just really the day before, that this strikes Jesus. Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verse 27, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. She says, my, my soul is troubled, but this is the reason why I came. And this said, he said, signifying what death he should die. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew that the hour was there. He knew it was happening. And beyond that, he knew that all things were placed in his hands, the Bible says. What, what does it mean that, that this is all placed in his hands? That literally the, the actuality, the reality of salvation is in the hands of Jesus. His death on the cross is going to pay for our sins. It's, it's in his hand. The ball's in his court. You, not Thursday, because it was a great Steelers game Thursday, and Big Ben played well, but previous to Thursday, if you're a Steelers fan, you've, you've watched a few games this season and maybe been frustrated with Ben. He's, he's, he's not had the world's greatest season. I've watched a few games, and I've looked at it and thought, Ben, put the ball in Bell's hands, please. Like, that guy can run the football, put the ball in his hands, trust him with it, let him win the game, right? What this is saying is that the ball was in Jesus' hands. This was the actuality of salvation is now on his shoulders. And he knows this. This is not a surprise to him. He knows this, the Bible says. And beyond that, the Bible tells us in, in the end of verse number three that he, was, he knew that he was come from God and that he went to God. Jesus knew his origin and his destiny, He's fully cognizant of who he is, where he's from, where he's going. And, and the fact that he knew this is actually what often sets the priest and the scribes' teeth on edge, right? Because Jesus knew who he was, and he often told them who he was. That he was the I am. That he was God in the flesh. That he was come to pay for the sins of the world. He often tells them this, that I am the Son of Man. You'll see me coming in, in power and in glory. And this is what makes them angry. This is what they think is heresy. This is what they're ticked at. That he would call himself the Messiah, the Christ, the, the Son of God. That he would say, But Jesus knew who he was. He oftentimes says exactly that. And this statement is meant to really confound us and to set the stage for the next few verses. Because in the next few verses, Jesus is about to perform the ministry of a slave. And John wants to make it abundantly clear that when Jesus performs this ministry, when he takes this condescension, that it's nothing short of remarkable because Jesus knew who he was. When Jesus decides to minister like a slave does, all the while he knows he's God in the flesh. He knows his origin and his destiny. He knows what he's about to accomplish to pay for the sins of the world. So what Jesus is about to do is flat out remarkable, and I want you to see it. He goes from the table where they're eating, it's done now, and, and he takes on the towel. And inside of this, Jesus does this deed, and then there's this dialogue or discourse that opens up with Peter. Look at, at verse number four. Jesus riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Jesus, the one who knows his origin and his destiny, God in the flesh, does this. And he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, feet washing is menial slave work. This is 100% revolutionary. There is no master, no leader, no rabbi, no even Jewish man in the first century that's going to wash someone else's feet. It's unheard of. You just, you don't do this. But Jesus is going to take on a towel. Jesus is going to gird himself with it, take off his garments, the, the crimson and purple garments that the soldiers would be casting lots for in just a few hours. He's going to lay those outer garments aside, and he's going to get into a position of service to wash the feet of these men. And according to Luke's gospel, this is directly after these men have just been bickering and arguing about who's the greatest. They're having this dialogue about who's the best and who's going to be on the, on the right hand and who's going to have the position of authority. So meanwhile, while they're having this, Jesus lays aside his garments and he begins to serve. You imagine the awkwardness in the room at that moment? 
They're having this discussion about, no, I'm better. No, I'm better. Well, I'm going to get, well, I'm going to, I'm me, 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 me. And here's Jesus taking off his garments, putting on a towel around him, going to wash their feet. This is Christ, our example, and a deed, our model, serving. And a dialogue and a discourse opens up when he gets to Peter. Verse number six. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, and the emphasis is on thou and I, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Like you above me going to wash my feet? Jesus says in verse number seven, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter, look, you don't even get what I'm about to do, man. You, you understand feet washing, but this is much deeper than that. You don't even understand what I'm about to do, but give it a minute, it'll sink in, and you'll get what I'm about to do. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Peter doubles down. Now you ain't, these little piggies ain't going to market today. You ain't touching these. Jesus says, If I don't touch them, then you're not with me. So what's Peter's response? Classic Peter. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Lord, get the hose, get the shampoo, just wash me down. Just, just let's go crazy on this. So Jesus has a very logical, natural response to Peter. Peter, he that's washed needeth not to save to wash his feet, but is clean everywhere. What he says is, Peter, if you've already had a bath, you're clean all over the place, you don't need to be washed except for your feet. You're clean everywhere. Okay, that's not needed. And then he says this, ye are all clean but not all. Verse 11, for he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Jesus has this moment with Peter, and he looks up, and he looks at them, and he says, you know what, you're all clean, but eh, no, not all of you. And he knew that there was one that internally, this, this, this lesson is much deeper than the ritual. It's meant to be the spiritual. Jesus is trying to teach them a profound lesson, and he's trying to teach them servant leadership. He's trying to teach them even beyond that, that there's one in the room that is, that's not clean, that's not right, that's going to betray him. And, and this discourse unfolds, and Jesus says, look, Peter, I'm going to do this, accept this, and here's the reason why. And, and this is really where it starts to press into us and come home for us, that he's going to explain the teaching to them. He's going to tell them, look, I'm, I'm, I gave you an example, but more than an example, I, I'm going to give you an expectation that you do this as well. Verse number 12. What's the teaching? After he had washed their feet and taken his garments, he was set down again, and he said to them, know ye what I've done to you? Guys, you get this? You know what just happened? Now, they, they knew what physically just happened. Yeah, you just, you just washed our feet, and that was real uncomfortable for us. But there's, there's more to the teaching than that. Verse number 13, you call me master and Lord, you say, well, for so I am. Look, you call me the master, you call me Lord. Spot on. You're right. I am. Verse number 14, if, if then your Lord and master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example. Jesus said, okay. If I, Lord and Master, am going to serve, if I'm going to minister, if I'm going to take a position of humility, if I'm going to do this, then shouldn't you do this? I'm doing this not just to do this because I love you, but I'm doing this for an example for you. I'm doing this to teach you something. I'm giving you this. Like, I, and it's, it's beautiful to me that Jesus just doesn't tell them, hey, go serve each other and love each other. He does it for them. He gives them an object lesson. Like in living color, in the flesh, he, he exhibits this for them so that they can see what is happening. And you have to understand this act of service, number one, against the backdrop of Jesus as God, and number two, against the backdrop of first century leadership. Like first century leadership, you may have in your lifetime in church and, 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 and maybe a business setting even heard Truett Cathy teach on servant leadership or something. You may have heard that, but not in the first century. That, that was not a lesson being taught. First century leaders were nasty people. They were arrogant. They were self-grandizing. They were self-promoting. They were self-centered. They were, they were violent. Read about the Caesars. Read about the Herods. There's a common denominator amongst them all. They're crazy. Like they're genocidal almost. It does anything to protect their power, anything to protect their position, anything to protect their authority. Kill my kid, kill my wife, kill someone else. It doesn't matter. That's first century leadership that is promoted even amongst the Jews, even a rabbi to take a position in a towel and to serve and to wash someone's feet is it, no way. 
Shakespeare has, has a few lines, and I'm not a Shakespeare buff, but I love these few lines in his play Julius Caesar, where he describes who Julius Caesar was and what those thought of him. And he, and he has a scene where, where Cassius and Brutus are discussing and plotting how they could possibly betray Julius Caesar. And they describe Caesar this way, which is so intriguing to me. They say that Caesar, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus. He's a, he's a giant of a man, not literally, but figuratively. And we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. What Shakespeare is saying, what, what was that description of a Caesar? He's a monster of a man who walks around squashing people. That, that was first century leadership. And Jesus says, no. You don't walk around squashing people. You don't protect your, your authority at all costs. You serve and guys, I'm giving you an example here. Your master, your Lord, I'm serving you. Guys, what's going to be your excuse? Now, this is where it starts to hit home to us, right? Because he's our master and our Lord as well. This isn't just for the disciples. This is for us as modern disciples, as, as 21st century Christians, that our master and our Lord served and, and took a towel upon himself, washed someone else's feet, and so too should we. And sadly, not much has changed in our styles of leadership from the first century. It, it may not be as in vogue. You can't just kill people openly now. But we get frustrated, do we not, with politicians who use their position and use their power and use their authority to leverage it for themselves and for, and for personal gain. Don't we get frustrated by that sometimes? We get frustrated with bosses, with businesses, with employers that treat employees like numbers rather than people. We get frustrated with parents that take their position of authority that should be used to love their children and do what's best for them, but they leverage it to in, in, in a position of abuse. We get frustrated, and right, rightfully so, with pastors. Some pastors are guilty of this, where they become king of their own little island, the authoritarian that's going to rule at all costs, and they're, they're going to use their, their position or their authority to be abusive. That, that, that hasn't changed that much. That's, that's still happening today. And Jesus says, no, look at me. I'm the king of kings. I'm the Lord of lords. I'm the master, and I'm serving. So too should, you should too. Look at the example that I am giving you. Look at how I'm washing your feet. And beyond this example, he gives them an expectation. Verse number 15 continues. And he says, look, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Now you do the same. Now, now you serve. Verse number 16, verily, verily. Now, verily, verily means pay attention. Like truly, truly. Guys, I'm about to teach you a profound lesson. Perk your ears up here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that sent greater than he that has sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. He says, look, the, the student is a, isn't above the teacher. The sent one, the apostle, isn't above the sender. The, the servant isn't above the master. So if, if I did this, what's your excuse? If, if I, the leader Christ, was willing to humble myself and I was willing to serve other people, shouldn't you as Christians humble yourself and serve other people as well? If, if I ministered, you should minister. If, if, if Jesus took on humility, if Jesus set aside relaxation, if Jesus even became obedient unto the death, uh, unto death, even the death of the cross, the Bible tells us, if he can do this, then shouldn't we squash our pride? Shouldn't we set aside just being completely self-focused and self-interested? And shouldn't we maybe miss out on some relaxation? Shouldn't we serve? And Jesus is saying, verily, verily, this is the lesson, guys. I served. I'm the example. I'm Lord. So too should you. This is not Jesus saying, look what I did and say, Jesus, wow, he did that. I wish I could be like Jesus, but I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'll just never get there. No, that's not the lesson. The lesson is, I did this, you do it. You don't just look at me in glory and, and say, wow, that was amazing. It was. But beyond that, it should move us to action. There were real life implications for Jesus washing their feet. These disciples actually had something to do now. Jesus basically says to these people, you should be people of the towel. Guys, I just served you, and I just gave you an example. Be people of the towel. Grab a towel, wrap it around yourself, and serve somebody else. Do this. Go minister. Go be rich in good works. Go 
do this for someone else. Now that applies to us. That applies to this discussion on serving. Should we, should we be motivated and should we serve because there's just a, a command in the Bible to do it and because we have the means to do it? Absolutely. Should we serve because we're made to minister and we're called to that and it's there that we'll find fruitfulness and fulfillment? Absolutely. Should we serve because there's actually a spiritual gift that's wrapped up inside of us that we should, that we should unpack it, we should discover, we should use that to build up the body of Christ? Absolutely. But beyond that, we should look at the example of Jesus Christ that in all things, he has the preeminence. So we look at him and we say, look at what he did and he tells us this is our example. Now we should be motivated by the model of Christ. Now we should be motivated by his humility, by his love, by what he did. This is what Paul tells the Philippians. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind, and it always starts in the mind and the attitude and the internal first. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And that is a profound statement that Jesus there, God in the flesh, and he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. There's the model. The sacrifice, the love, the humility, the service that we're to pattern ourselves after. Now keep in mind This is all birthed out of a heart of love. Jesus loved them to the moon and back. Jesus is not giving them something to do just because he wants to add a burden to them. He's not not giving them the example and the teaching of service just so that he can say, you know what, I did something. I feel like you should pull your weight too, guys. Why don't you do something too? This is birthed out of a heartbeat of love. And verse number 17 is key because he says, if you know these things... Happy are ye if ye do them. So there's internal, external. So first first there's a knowledge, then then there's a doing. So in, in the teaching of Jesus, there's no division between head knowledge and heart action. Those two are meant to go together. And, and happiness does not consist of knowing. Happiness really consists of doing here. And, and this is Jesus saying, look, guys, am I doing this because you should model after me? Absolutely. Am I doing this so that you will serve other people? Absolutely. But, guys, there's, there's part of this. This is for you. Because if you do this, my heart of love for you is to give you instruction that's for your betterment. This is for your benefit. If you know this and you do this, happy are ye. Remember the quotation of Jesus in Acts 20, verse 35? Remember the words of Jesus, how he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive? Those are in the same line. Now, that does not mean that receiving is bad. Receiving is blessed too. Just giving is more blessed. Can you relate with that? Receiving is blessed. How many of you like, be honest, how many of you like to receive gifts? Don't we all? Some of you have a gift love language more, more than other people. There's something really awesome about Christmas, having a present, opening it up, discovering what's inside of there. There is is a little bit of euphoria that comes with that. There is some excitement. Maybe not when you're like five years old excitement, but there is. There is. There's an anticipation. There's, there's, There's a joy. There's a happiness. There's a blessedness that comes out of that, of receiving a gift. But Jesus says, if you give, you're more blessed. You, you want to know what that's like? Take the reception, take what you get from that, and multiply it. And you'll be more blessed. You'll be happy if you do this. You'll be happy if you serve. What that means is when you begin to minister and serve, you begin to discover good things. You begin to discover fulfillment. You begin to discover fruitfulness. You begin to discover joy. You even begin to discover community with other people that we're serving together and working together. And there's a sense of of community that comes. There's a sense of satisfaction that comes from serving people because God has built us that way. He's designed us. Jesus, who's God in the flesh, who knows all, loves these men, is going to give them instruction that he knows them, how they're made, literally how they're made. He made them. He's going to give them instruction that's for their good. That's for their own personal benefit for their own happiness i would say it this way here's the simplest way i could put it if you enjoy coming to church and hearing the choir sing cornerstone and that blesses you and you enjoy hearing 
Caleb sing and Justine play and her, you, them using their gifts for the Lord and that blesses you and you enjoy taking in the Bible and you enjoy someone that greets you with, with a smile and with a warm handshake and hands you a bulletin and you receive and you take in and people give and you take in and you take in that ministering. We all enjoy that. There's nothing wrong with enjoying that. You should want that. You should want to be fed. You, all of that. But if you enjoy that, if you enjoy your kids being served in the nursery, in junior church, them having a class that's designed specifically, if you enjoy that, try doing it. It's more blessed. It's actually better. There's more happiness. There's more joy. There's more satisfaction that comes from you actually giving out rather than just taking in. And Jesus says, it's more blessed. Happy are ye if you do this. Understand, guys, that this model is an example for you, and it's for you to actually begin to exhibit this yourself. But this is not just a pointless task to, to put. It's not a burden. There's joy in serving Jesus. He's our model. He did it. That should be enough. But there actually is, is benefit, self-benefit for us to serve other people. Now, I don't think the service of Jesus would be fully realized without mentioning his death on the cross. Now, he, he serves these men and he washes their feet. And he says, now you do it. Now you be rich in good works. Now, now you serve. Now you minister. Now you take a little connection card and pick a service that you're going to serve at during December. Now you go to the Be Rich table and fill out a, a Be Rich card in ways that you could minister. Now you do a random act of kindness this week. Now you go help your neighbor rake their leaves. Now you share the gospel. You do it, right? But it goes beyond that. The service and the ministry of Jesus Christ goes far beyond that. And I want to end with Mark 10. Mark 10 tells us, Jesus says this, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Jesus says, I didn't come for people to serve me. I came to minister, to deacon, to serve other people. Then he says this, and to give his life a ransom for many. The service of Jesus Christ is most fully realized in what we've sung about today that he gives his life a ransom for many. And I would even say this, if, if you're in the room and you've, you've never discovered that gift, that Jesus has never served you in that way, he gave his life for you, and now he would love to even give further. He'd love to give you the gift of eternal life. And his ministering is there on the cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, that it's there that he gives the ultimate sacrifice. That he lays down his life for us. He pays the debt I could not pay. We sing about it. He takes our nails. He takes our pain. And there, as a ransom for many, he pays the price. Many of you in this room, you know the ministering of Jesus personally because you know he gave his life for you and he's given you the gift of eternal life. Some of you maybe not. And if, you have, if you've never discovered that, I can promise you this. He would love to give to you today. He's not a taker. He's a giver. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants to give you heaven. He wants to give you forgiveness of sins. He wants, he wants to give you why he went to the cross, to give his life a ransom for many. And he would love, if you have never accepted him, for you this morning to make this day, November 19th of 2017, the day that you accept Jesus Christ and you really discover what it means to follow Jesus, you discover what it really means to serve and to be a Christ follower. I hope that you'll do that today if you never have. Let's pray.